Diamond's hot August night at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. And who can forget Neil Diamond's triumphant 38,000-plus Australian concert at the Sydney Sports Ground last year. And Channel 9, in conjunction with General Motors Holden, will be showing Neil Diamond's latest triumph, the TV concert he recorded again at the Greek Theater to a live audience. And it's called Love at the Greek, and it's going to be shown the 27th of April in both Sydney and Melbourne. And now by satellite from Los Angeles, the fabulous Neil Diamond. Here. From one displaced New Yorker to another, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> how are you? You know, uh, you'd be surprised how many displaced New Yorkers there are in this world. No, you I find wouldn't. them all over. <laughs> Every place you look, actually. You were nervous about your concert career, Neil, uh, after your absence from the scene for about four years. How significant was the, uh, the, the Australian tour and your comeback? comeback? It was very significant because psychologically I had to get over the hurdle of performing in front of an audience again. I had been away for almost four years. And it's uh, it's uh, difficult to to uh, accustom yourself to uh, to actually what's going on uh, at a concert, and uh, but I got into it very quickly. Really, what the Aust the Australian tour did for me was to uh, to uh, give me courage and uh, encourage me and to break the ice uh, that that layer of fear that I had been uh, um, surrounding myself with. Can I go back? Should I ever go back? Should I perform again? Will the audience accept me? Will they like what I do? These are all the questions that you ask yourself, and I've been asking myself for these questions for uh, almost four years. So Australia, uh, you know, it gave me the courage to do Las Vegas without any question. I didn't accept Las Vegas until I completed my final uh, concert in Australia. and. Uh, my agent was there and I said, okay, let's go and do Las Vegas, which was a whole other thing that I had never done before. And that uh, led me to Forest Hills Tennis Stadium, which has not had concerts for four or five years in New York. And we opened, uh, we opened that venue again to concerts and then to the Greek Theater. But Australia was the, the key. You, you know, Neil, for years I heard of Neil Diamond, I heard his songs and his music, and I made a comment many years ago that I never really knew what you looked like because even on the cover of the Hot August uh, Night album uh, you couldn't really make out what Neil Diamond was about. Uh, was that done purposely? Did you deliberately keep yourself sort of anonymous like that? I, I think that's probably, uh, there's probably uh, quite a lot of truth to that. I've tried to stay away from uh, um, the public eye only to maintain um, you know, the quiet and peaceful boundaries that each of us have around our uh, own lives. Unfortunately, if you're in the public eye, you don't have that, and uh, it makes life unnatural, uh, abnormal. You cannot be part of everything else. You're a part. You can't be an observer. You're the observed. So I try to stay away from it for a long time, and uh, but I just realize that it's not uh, com doing that is not really uh, compatible with with what I do. I'm a public performer and a public person. So uh, so I'm in front of the public again, and. Uh, Mm -hmm. But right, Hot August Night does not look like me at all. That's right. I love the, the I love the lighting on the pants. I think that was the thing that made me de decide to uh, use that picture. I thought <laughs> the lighting was very good. <laughs> the Cashbox magazine, talking about your huge concert success, was quoted as saying, they "Quoted you as saying, I like to do scary things. Well, what is it that scares you, and why?" Well, any time you get up in front of an audience of. Uh, thousands of people it's uh, uh, it's put up or shut up and it can be scary uh, you don't know whether they're with you how they're with you what they want what what you want and you've got to get it together that night you've only got you've got two hours to make it all happen that's scary doing things for the first time is a little scary and I try to do that because when you get a little scared it gets your adrenaline up and you, you wonder gee can I do this and Generally, what I end up doing is I end up committing to doing something and then trying to uh, trying to achieve it. Well, I know, for, I know for a fact that you desperately wanted to play the lead in the film of the life story of the controversial American comedian Lenny Bruce, and that never came to fruition. But uh, carrying on with that, would motion pictures be your next scary thing? <laughs> yeah, that's scary. Yeah. Motion pictures are real scary. I'm liable to be scared off... Uh, the motion pictures for the next five years, but if I get them enough courage, I might try it next year. I don't know, but it's real scary. <laughs> One last question. Uh, in Rolling Stone magazine, I read an article where you felt a great affinity with the Kennedy family, and I must say that so did I. I was a huge fan of JFK's, 
And years ago, uh, Dion, who used to be with Dion in the Belmonts, did a thing called Abraham, Martin, and John. And I often wondered why someone with your sensitivity um, never decided to try and do a song or something in relation to the Kennedys. Did that thought ever come to your mind? Well, I have, I've touched on some of those things in a number of the songs. Dry Your Eyes, which is in the Beautiful Noise album, is really a song about the, uh, uh, the loss of heroes. Uh, JFK, Martin Luther King, our heroes, our American contemporary heroes. Uh, and I have written songs like that, but uh, uh, I don't really like to stand on a soapbox, and uh, I, I tend to prefer to deal on an emotional level. Uh, it's the kind of person I am, and I think that's what music's strength is, uh, to communicate and tie people together on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's what I'm after. Um, uh, and uh, I, don't, uh, I don't get into politics, and, uh, uh, but um, I don't know. Things change. Maybe someday I will. In, uh, also in that same article, you made mention of the fact that you, uh, you retired your father, who had a dry goods store. And I was wondering, was, was that a goal of yours? Was that important to you, to be able to do that for your family? Yeah, I, I wanted to do that. I, I, I promised him when I was a kid that I would do that someday, because here was a man who was full of life, a vibrant man. He wanted to be out and seeing the world, and he was, uh, he was really locked up in this little store every day. And uh, I worked with him a lot, and we, we really, our relationship grew from that experience. But uh, I wanted to get him out as soon as I could, because uh, He's 60 now, and uh, I want him to see all the things that he's wanted to see. Um, it, it, Neil, in Sydney, you sank to 38,000 people. Now, I'm sure, I don't know for a fact if that's your largest crowd ever, but that's a huge crowd. Do you ever see faces? Sure, you see faces. You, uh, sometimes you see individual faces, sometimes you see groups of faces. It's not the kind of thing that you look generally and concentrate on something, but you, it's like subliminal. It, comes into your mind you see a smiling face over there you tend to be seeing in that direction because you want to perform to the people who are enjoying it and getting into it so I generally point myself in the direction of the group that's digging it most and and do it for them but you see faces and things I mean it's extraordinary I have the best seat in the house because I can it's all out there panorama <laughs> you uh, uh, last year at Channel 9 they were impressed with everything you did but mostly and I was impressed with this myself, I must admit, your attention to detail. Now, what areas does that cover, and how far do you take that? I take it to ridiculous lengths. Uh, <clears throat> well, not really, but uh, I, I like to do things. I mean, my kick is doing it well, doing it beautifully, doing it, I don't know, grandly, mm. greatly, you know, I, not greatly, doing it well. And uh, there's an awful lot involved in doing something well. And. Uh, uh, it takes time and effort, and uh, it's not only time and effort on my part, but there are many, many people who uh, uh, who work around me and do some extraordinary things as well, in sound and lighting and staging, and of course the musicians. You know, I'm just one instrument in that group. Uh, the voice is maybe the most important instrument, but it's it's one instrument in the whole ensemble. Uh, taking it just a step further, Neil, uh, you were interested in, uh, in things like demographics and so forth. You wanted a breakdown of what audiences were watching you and what age brackets they were and what times they were watching and where they were. I, I found out all these things, but uh, do you take it as far as like uh, seeking out experts for even little minute things like, for instance, clothing and uh, lighting areas of the show and your own sound people and so forth? Uh, these people are experts in what they do, and uh, I depend on them very heavily. See, I'm just the singer. I'm just the vocalist. If you pass my dressing room, it's a vocalist <laughs> and musicians and stage designer and lighting designer and sound technicians. Mm -hmm. And everybody's involved in the presentation. Does, um, uh, <clears throat> through TV now, everyone does know you. Uh, has it changed your life over this last short span of time where you have uh, revisited again and I'm sure your face being a lot more familiar to people? Interestingly enough, it hasn't changed my, uh, it hasn't changed my life that much. I was afraid that it would. One of the reasons that I avoided American television was because I wanted to be able to walk down the street and, uh, you know, just walk down the street. Mm. And I thought that, my God, if I do a television thing, everybody's going to know what I look like. They'll come over. I won't be able to... It just didn't happen like that. I got up the next morning and had my breakfast and walked down the street. And it was, uh, 
it was great. It was a revelation to me. I said, hey, I can, I can go and do television. I can be on television. I can even do movies someday because it doesn't really change your life that much. So this, this show and its airing in the States was, was a revelation to me. And your children. You, I noticed that you have avoided pictures of them and so forth. There's a very, very big group here and now clicking in America called ABBA. And when I spoke with them, um, I mentioned to them about their children, and they said they didn't like pictures of their children being taken because they were fearful for them. Do you, do you uh, share that sentiment? No, I'm not, I'm not fearful for them. I don't like, <coughs> excuse me, Don, I don't like pictures taken of them because I don't, I don't believe that they should be um, separated from their group, from their friends, made anything special or any more special than anyone else. And if their picture is in the newspaper, uh, they're more special than anyone else, and uh, they're kids, and uh, uh, it's difficult to deal with. So therefore, they live a nor as normal a life as I can possibly get them to live within the uh, limits of their father's uh, uh, fame or uh, celebrity. Neil, thank you very, very much for taking the time to talk to us. We certainly appreciate it. We're all looking forward to Love at the Greek. I saw it the other night, and it's terrific. And thank you very much again. I appreciate it, and uh, send my best to everybody out there, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, we'll be out in Australia, hopefully within the next uh, 12 months, with, with uh, some special things. Uh, I hope somebody shows up. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. Neil Diamond, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. And we'll be right back after this world.